Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Rachel Gore, and I'm a genetic counselor with the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, working on a study of X and Y variations in collaboration with the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so I may have actually met some of you over the last few months um, if you've enrolled and joined our study. Um, thank you. And today we'll be providing an update about our study, our genome sequencing study that has been um, now going on for about two years. And then my colleague, Colleen, will talk about a recent review study that she's written. So I'll turn things over to Colleen to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for having us. My name is Colleen Chodarski, and I'm also a genetic counselor on the same team as Rachel and have been working with um, the SCA families over the past couple of years during this collaboration. And so, as I said, we'll provide an update and then talk about a review paper that's more specific to XYY. Um, so this is our team. You may have met some of us. Um, our team includes genetic counselors and geneticists who analyze the genome data. And then we also work with Dr. Armin Rosnahan, uh, Jonathan Blumenthal, and Aaron Torres, who you may have met as well. Um, and so we're a collaborative team that works together both in, um, in terms of our interact interactions with families and then behind the scenes when we analyze the genome data. And so my colleague, Mike Setzer, spoke at this conference two years ago, introducing our study. Um, and so we wanted to provide an update. Since then, we've had the privilege of meeting with many of you, many um, individuals with X and Y variations and their families, um, and have really appreciated the opportunity to learn from your stories and, and hear from you about your goals and priorities and incorporate that into our research. And so in general, the overall goal of this study was to understand some of the variability that we see among people with X and Y chromosome variations um, through this larger genetic test called genome sequencing. And so as, as you know from your experience, um, you know, we see variability in terms of what, if any, symptoms um, people experience, at what time in their life, to what degree. And so our question is, you know, could some of that potentially be related to a second genomic finding? For the most part, a lot of that variability is just because everyone is an individual and has their own, you know, life story and their own things that make them unique. Um, but in our working with um, this group, we've seen, you know, people that have um, symptoms that we um, typically expect to see with X and Y variations. And then we've seen people with symptoms that we're not necessarily sure if it's related or if there could actually be something else going on in addition. And so our hope was to first understand if there were any other genetic variants um, for individuals in our study that might be impactful for their health and important for them to know about. And then on a larger uh, scale to try to understand some of this variability, um, you know, could there be other markers in the genome that help us to understand why some people experience some symptoms and others experience other symptoms um, with the ultimate goal of being able to provide um, more detailed guidance to families early on in the diagnostic process, um, you know, to, to help provide some anticipation of, of what exactly to expect as, as their child gets older. And so our study process involves genetic counseling and consent where um, we discuss the, the genome sequencing study, ask questions about family history, answer any questions that families have about our study. Um, and that's where Colleen and I are, are very involved in meeting with families on the front end and you know, getting to know um, what's, on, what's on our participants' minds. Then um, comes genome sequencing. I won't go into too much detail about what that actually entails because it, it's outside of the scope of this presentation. But essentially, it's a large genetic test that looks at just about all of somebody's genetic code letter by letter. And again, we're looking for ge genetic variants you know, outside of the X and Y chromosome that might be interacting or causing other symptoms to help get a better picture of, of what's going on from a genetic perspective. And so that takes about six to eight months to analyze that data. And then um, if we do find any um, impactful results, we return them directly to, to our individuals and their families. 
And so in terms of where we are right now, um, we've met with 110 families. We're still enrolling um, a subset of families that are still coming to NIH for participation in the NIMH study. I should mention that um, being involved in the NIMH study is a requirement to be eligible for our study. Um, and so far, as we've analyzed the data, about 20% of the people in our study have received a new result, whether that's related to a symptom that they've had, such as developmental delays, or in one case, migraines or seizures, um, or in some cases, unrelated, where it predicts more of a future health risk that we share to allow families to be more proactive um, and preventative in terms of health. Um, and so as we expected for the majority of people, we did this test and did not find anything new. Um, and for um, a subset, we did actually find something. Um, and so if you um, participated in our study and, and have any questions about your results, please um, email me or the genetic counselor who you met with. We won't be able to answer specific questions about individual results um, today, but we're always happy to follow up with you if, if you have any questions. And so, um, as Mike had shared this slide back in 2021, our goal was to look at this genome sequence data and first provide a clinical analysis, so provide any information that might be helpful to the individual in terms of understanding their symptoms or health risks for the future. And so that's where we're at right now. We're in the midst of this process. We've returned a number of these results. Um, and we found that um, while we do have some results like this, the majority, uh, for the majority of people in our study, we did not find anything new to report. And so then the second piece is this larger question, how does DNA play a role in variability in symptoms among individuals with X and Y chromosome variations? Are there other DNA differences in our patients that we can identify to help answer this question? Um, and so this piece is ongoing. It's a longer term project that we'll continue to work on as we gather more data. Um, and so, you know, th this piece is just beginning, even though the clinical analysis piece is well underway. And we hope to have more updates on this um, in the future. Um, so with that, I will turn things over to Colleen to share findings from a review paper um, specific to genetic counseling um, considerations for individuals with XYY. Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so this project was really born out of the study um, that we were doing in our collaboration with NIMH, um, and particularly just being moved by the, the stories of, of families who've had, um, uh, who have XYY um, and wanting to, uh, realizing that we're able to, there were opportunities to provide um, improved care. Um, and so really there were two developments also within the field uh, that, that motivated this review. One was the, the increased use of non-invasive prenatal screening, meaning that, that more pregnant women are using this test. And so there are likely going to be more individuals diagnosed with XYY early. Um, and so people within the, the genetic specialty and outside of it are more likely to encounter someone with XYY. And then also through um, deep phenotyping and biobanking efforts, um, we're realizing that the phenotypic variability uh, for XYY is, is um, perhaps more vast than we initially appreciated. And so both of those sort of motivated, um, you know, wanting to have updated um, information for the for the field, uh, particularly particularly for genetic counselors. And so really the goals of this project were to describe the neurodevelopmental presentation of individuals with XYY, talk about um, updated management recommendations, focusing on the psychosocial needs of families, um, as well as focusing on counseling recommendations as well. So just a brief symptom overview, I'm sure many in, in this audience are familiar with XYY, but it's characterized by really quite variable neurodevelopmental features. So developmental delay, particularly speech and language, um, some cognitive impairment, there tends to be a lot of variability there, um, but sometimes trends toward the lower end of normal. There can be different behavioral challenges, such as withdrawal, thought and attention problems, um, aggressive behavior and social emotional functioning problems, as well as increased risk for um, certain mental health conditions and neurodevelopmental disorders. So things like autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and sometimes mood disorders as well. Um, 
In addition, there tends to be an increased incidence of learning disabilities in individuals who have XYY, um, and sometimes this can lead to academic difficulties and um, individuals often receive special education. Um, however, a recent study looked also at the strengths of individuals with XYY and found that they have um, strengths in the areas of curiosity, humor, teamwork, as well as STEM subjects. And so, you know, wanting to also focus on the aspects of this diagnosis that that come with that are strengths and that can be targeted um, in the classroom as well. And so um, thinking about recommendations for management. Um, you know, the last genetic counseling review paper that was published related to counseling for X and Y variations was published in 2003. And so in the last 20 years, a lot has changed in our understanding and um, recommendations for management, primarily being comprehensive neuropsychological and educational screening early um, to screen for the different learning disabilities and neurodevelopmental disorders um, to really target early intervention, um, which is associated with improved outcomes. Additionally, discussing some of these recommendations during the prenatal period um, can be helpful so that parents can be better prepared um, and help to bridge the gap between prenatal and postnatal care. Um, additionally, the folks out in Colorado have a really great interdisciplinary clinic um, that sort of provides a model for this type of care. Um, they have a bunch of different specialists um, that op um, provide the opportunity for comprehensive and individualized care tailored to the unique needs of each child. And so being able to focus in on, on you know, the unique individual and what, what they may need to, to succeed. And so then talking about XYY within the family system, um, you know, there's different, different um, points throughout this um, diagnosis and process. And so the first being the reaction to receiving this diagnosis. Um, what we found in the literature is that often this diagnosis comes as a surprise, um, not something that people are expecting when they're doing prenatal testing. Um, and sometimes that can cause it to present as a traumatic event and trigger feelings of grief, distress, and guilt. Um, additionally, within the, the prenatal context, it can cause uncertainty and worry, um, but this tends to improve with a more thorough understanding of the diagnosis and its prognosis. And so one thing we found as well is the, the timing of the diagnosis and how that impacts, um, you know, families' reaction to that information. You know, people who are po diagnosed postnatally may feel relief um, at finding an answer for you know, the presenting issues, whereas in the prenatal period um, can lead to increased feelings of depression, anxiety, and feeling less optimistic overall. And so, you know, thinking as healthcare providers, how we how we approach the conversation, um, the way in which the diagnosis is initially communicated to parents by the provider is really important because um, we found that that it can influence two key um, factors going forward. One is that whether or not parents seek out additional information and how that subsequent information is perceived. Um, we found as well in reviewing the literature that, that parents reported not receiving up-to-date and easy-to-understand materials at the time of diagnosis, as well as an imbalance of information. And so um, emphasizing negative attributes over positive. Um, and so really what we saw here was an opportunity to better support families in communicating the diagnosis. And so, you know, through that process, thinking about a family's adaptation to a diagnosis, really, this is something that's continuous and happens, you know, over the, the lifespan. Um, it's not something that just, um, you know, is a discrete time point. Um, parents tend to perceive their child's diagnosis as having a larger negative impact on their child's mental health and functioning than the child does themselves. Um, they report high rates of parental stress and anxiety um, and greater difficulty in psychosocial domains, um, which would suggest that children with XYY are adapting to their diagnosis better than their parents and really provides another opportunity for us as providers to be able to partner with parents so that they feel as though they have the support that they need um, throughout this adaptation process. And then one um, you know, thing that's unique about the um, X and Y variation conditions is that largely these um, 
symptoms and presentations are unseen. And so families are faced with the difficult questions of if, when, and how to disclose the diagnosis and to whom. And we found that factors that affected um, parents' decisions to disclose the diagnosis were a level of functioning. Um, so individuals who had more challenges, um, parents were more likely to disclose the diagnosis as well as age. So the older a child got, um, parents were more likely to disclose that diagnosis. However, it's something that families tend to have to navigate on their own. Um, one of the studies that we looked at found that only 17% of families received counseling about um, diagnosis disclosure. Um, and so, again, just another opportunity for us to, as healthcare providers, offer support and guidance to families um, in navigating difficult questions. And so that leads me to talking about counseling for XYY. Um, you know, in doing our review of the literature, we didn't find anything specific to this, um, but there are a number of other um, conditions that um, highlight relevant issues of, of, um, that can be applied to XYY as well. So the first being this idea of balanced information. Um, and that study there from Pittman, it all was focused on parents of children with Down syndrome. Um, and ultimately what they found was that the idea of balance is, is difficult to achieve because everyone has their own unique experience. Um, but they did have some helpful recommendations that I think are applicable for XYY as well. Um, and so, you know, exploring past coping skills that have been helpful, um, imagining what life with an affected child would be would look like, um, really emphasizing similarities to other children. Um, you know, children with X and Y variations are more similar to other children than they are different. And so trying to help parents um, frame it that way as well. Communication should be parent driven. Um, and then Im the importance too of engaging with the community, which is why um, access is such a great resource um, to be able to have that um, interaction with other families. Um, the other a uh, counseling piece that we found um, that seemed applicable was from 22Q deletion syndrome. This is the idea of awareness to act, um, defined as confidence in being alert and equipped to manage um, and or protect their child's mental health. Um, and so the parents in this study expressed stress over missing possible red flags of mental illness um, and a limited awareness about the symptoms. And we can see, you know, how that could be applied to to X, Y, Y, um, given the risk of mental health conditions and parents not wanting to miss um, signs. And so, you know, this I, type of anticipatory guidance promotes a sense of agency for parents. Um, and, you know, it's important in the genetic counseling for this condition so that parents can feel equipped to to um, be their child's best av advocate. And so then looking ahead to areas for future research, um, obviously we think it's important to hear from families and individuals with XYY in their own words about what their needs are throughout the lifespan um, and areas that we can improve our, our support. Um, you know, tied to that is the idea of, of longitudinal studies to understand the impact of the diagnosis across the lifespan. Um, the Extraordinary Baby Study is, is starting to do that by enrolling um, children with X and Y variations. Um, but at this point, there's very few studies about X, Y, Y in adulthood. And so wanting to you know, just have a better understanding of, of what this diagnosis can look like throughout um, at different points in life. And then, you know, tied to what our study is doing, um, wanting to see, you know, what are the different biological and familial predictors of variability so that we can do a better job counseling people based on, you know, what their family um, picture looks like, if we can point to certain factors that may help explain um, variability and, and what that diagnosis may look like in the family. And so with that, um, just want to thank all of the wonderful people who that who have helped us uh, make this research possible. Um, and of course, the patients and their families, we couldn't do it without all of you. Um, so thank you so much again for having us and we'll happily take any questions that you have now.